Today is the 29th of January 2020 and this is my fourth, fifth, I've lost count already, uh, video log that I'm doing. I had an idea about what I was going to talk about tonight but I've kind of changed my mind um, because today we decided, my mum, my sister and I, that we're going to go get a tattoo on Sunday and I kind of wanted to talk about the tattoo that I'm getting, maybe also the other tattoos that I have. Um, but more importantly, the tattoo that I'm getting and why the three of us, we're all getting the same tattoo and why we're getting it. Uh, now my sister Adrienne, she's five years older than me and she's been a pain in my butt since birth. Um, we're those types of sisters that really don't get along too well. Um, I remember when she moved out and I went and told my doctor, my doctor's reply was, good, you'll be less stressed. So that kind of tells you how well my sister and I get along. But since she's moved out and she's gotten married, um, our relationship has become a lot better. An example I can, of that I can give, I don't know if I already said this in another video, but the example of that is in 2018, I voluntarily hospitalized myself. The hospital that I went to scared me. It was not like the previous, previous one I'd gone to in the end of 2016. It was not set out the same way. And the people I were mixed in with scared me. And I think I was there for two nights. And it would have been one night if I had gotten my way straight away. But two nights. And I was ringing mum and dad and begging them to come and pick me up. And they were saying, no, you need to stay there. We're not going to come get you. You need to suck it up. And I think before I went into hospital, my sister and I had this massive argument. And... When I called her crying, saying I needed her to talk to mum and dad, everything just stopped in a, in a heartbeat. And she said, I'll do what I can do. And when she called me back, she was really upset herself. And she said, I'm sorry, I talked to them. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if they're going to let you out. Um, but I tried my best. And I think that kind of shows the relationship that we have in, in that we'll fight like cats and dogs, but when it comes down to it, really comes down to it, we're there for each other in a heartbeat. Now, the tattoo that the three of us are getting is the endometriosis symbol, which is a yellow ribbon. So it's the ribbon, like the uh, breast cancer ribbon, uh, but it's just in yellow instead of pink. Now, what is endometriosis? Now, I'm probably not the best person to explain this. I'm doing it from my understanding of it um, and the way it's been described to me so I may get some details wrong if you ever watch this video I highly recommend that you look up what it is if you don't already know it's one of those things that isn't as highly publicized as breast cancer or any type of cancer or anything like that <sighs> to my knowledge it's not deadly but it's still an absolutely horrible thing to live with so from my understanding, endometriosis is when you get your period, you have a lining in your uterus. That lining has somehow escaped the uterus and it travels throughout your whole body. Now, the, my, my, uh, the way I'm going to describe this in no way is going to be what it is because I haven't experienced personally. But where that endometriosis ends up sitting, it's constant... It feels like cramps. I don't believe it is cramps, but it feels like really inten intense cramps all day, every day. Uh, now, my sister started, I think it was, started experiencing pain in 2014. Might have been earlier. I know, I know definitely 2016 she had her diagnosis, but I think around that 2014 period... Um, was kind of when she started realizing her pains weren't normal and she went to a lot of doctors it took her a really long time to get the correct diagnosis because when you're a girl and you say I have pains in my like stomach area uterus area and they go in and they can't find anything obvious they think that you 
are just having really bad period cramps and it's nothing more than that it's something you need to suck up and it took Adrienne a really long time to find a doctor who could one find that it was endometriosis and to believe that what she was saying wasn't just normal period cramps and I think a lot of women go through that stage of trying to find a doctor who will believe them when they say it's serious and will look more than just skin deep will not just do kind of like an x-ray or um a colonoscopy to just have a look around and if they don't see anything they kind of brush it off where they actually look at it and go digging deeper to find what it is um, another kind of person in the media, in Australia at least, that has it is Emma Wiggle from The Wiggles. Um, she's very vocal about her struggle with it as well. Um, there's a lot of women. I think it's 1 in 10, I think, women that can be diagnosed with endometriosis. And some of them, I don't want to say are lucky, but they can have it removed and that's kind of the end of it. Or uh, well, they can have something done, a procedure done. I don't know if it's removing the ovaries or the uterus itself, which means they can't have children. Um, but they can have procedures that either calm it down or get rid of it. Because I know a lot, Adrian has experienced a lot of, oh, I had this done, it cured me, it'll cure you. Um, as we all know, what works for one person may not necessarily work for the other. So she's had to put up with a lot of shit coming from people of yours can't be that bad because mine wasn't that bad. She's had to go through a lot of shit with employers who haven't understood the severity. I guess it's, I don't want to be sexist or anything, but I guess it's kind of a male thing because they don't experience that pain. I know they can experience pains that to them they can get through but when I say my sister's in a lot of pain I really mean it my sister is incredibly strong and I mean that she'll be in a really intense pain that most of us would be doubled over crying in and she'll just get up and keep going and she'll get up and go to work and she'll suck it up and she'll keep going and it really amazes me that she's able to do that because I wouldn't you know I look at her and with every fiber of my being I wish I could take that pain away if I could transfer it to myself I would but I also know if I could do that I would not be able to handle it my sister and I'll say this once I say this a million times is so friggin strong um She doesn't intentionally do this at all, but with what she goes through and how she just keeps going on with every single day, I don't know how she does it. It makes me feel really guilty for having severe suicidal thoughts when I don't have anything physically wrong with me, whereas she is in constant pain and she just keeps going. You know, there's days where she literally can't move from the pain. It's that bad. It makes her physically sick. and But she, she does her best to keep going. She doesn't let it take over her life and rule her. She works in a job industry where she helps people who claim disability, disability through the government um, find jobs. And there's a percentage of those people who genuinely either one can't work or two can't work well because of their disability from my understanding there's a larger percentage of people that can work but choose not to and so I think my sister really struggles when people come in kind of playing up anything there are there are lots of people that do play up especially mental health things. And I'm the first to say that mental health is not something you mess around with. I'm having to start go th going through that program because I haven't been able to get a job. I've been looking for about a month now, started January. And I said to my mum and dad that if it got towards the end of January, I would sign up with their company to try and give me a, a hand. I personally don't want to go on disability payments because 
there's people out there that need it more than me. But I find that there's that people in my kind of situation that do have really bad mental health. And there are people that have it better and worse than me. Sometimes play it up to be able to stay on that disability payment and not have to work. Because there are people that cheat the system. To stay in the system, you kind of have to look for a certain amount of jobs a week. Um, and you have to log those jobs. And there are people who purposely look at jobs that they know and that they're never going to get. Uh, such as if you're, if you're only qualified for an entry-level position, they're looking at becoming a doctor or a nurse. As long as they apply for those jobs. And I think the government's looking into fixing this because there's a lot of us that really kind of go, how is that fair? Um, but yeah, so she has to deal with a lot of people that don't... How do I put this? They don't suffer as much as what they say they do, and she knows because she has to talk to them a lot. There's a difference between someone who can't physically walk versus somebody who's obese and doesn't want to walk, but they claim disability. That's the kind of difference I'm talking about. And she has to talk to the people that play up what they've got, that want to get payments from the government, whereas she has never gone on disability. She works the standard 35, 40 hours a week. And she should be one of those people, in my opinion, that doesn't have to work the standard hours because of how much pain she's in. Not only does she have endometriosis, she's also got mental health issues and she's also got um, arthritis, severe arthritis. I think it's something that, I don't know if it's something that can run in your family. We kind of always joke that dad gave me the shitty mental health or I got the shitty health, mental health from mum and dad, whereas Adrienne got all the problems because dad has arthritis as well and mum used to have... Uh, intestinal issues not endometriosis but other things so we kind of always joke that Adrienne got the short end of the stick um because she has a lot more problems um but yeah I just really amazes me every day that I see her and I see her sucking it up and some days um like at the moment if she has to stay home because of her pain I'll try and go and visit her to check in on her and she just she looks sick like, she puts on her makeup and she goes about a day and you wouldn't know that there's anything wrong with her. And that's what's really hard about invisible illnesses is that you can look perfectly fine, but when you tell someone that you're sick, their response would be that you're perfectly fine. And that's incredibly unfair. And there's a lot of people that suffer from different illnesses that are classed as inv invisible illnesses or um, chronic pain. And just like my sister, they have to get on with everyday life. And so I decided to get the endometriosis tattoo, the three of us, to one, represent my sister, and two, to kind of raise awareness. I'm getting it on my kind of arm. I'm, I think I'm going to get it below the crook of my elbow here. And what I'm hoping is I'm putting it in a, in, in a visible enough place that people can see it. But also, I believe in being able to hide your tattoos. That's just my personal choice. Um, that if you wanted to or if it was a job requirement, you can hide your tattoos. Um, so that's what I'm doing. One, it's visible. If people want to ask me what it is, they can. And I'm more than happy to open up that discussion because endometriosis is, isn't is well publicised. There are a few female people in the public eye that either have it or know people that have it and they do try to talk about it. We've been watching I'm a Celebrity, the Australian edition, and Erin, I don't remember her last name, but Erin was supporting Endometriosis Australia and that was kind of who we were cheering on because you really think that they need the funding. Now, all the other charities were great. Please do not get me wrong, but I guess because that one's close to our hearts, just like if you're, if they were uh, doing, I think someone was doing breast cancer, um, obviously if someone in your family suffers from breast cancer, that one's going to be close to your heart and that's the one that you're going to want to win the $100,000 that goes towards the charity. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it really, she she's had... 
a really tough time. Uh, as I said, doctors didn't believe it. She's gone through so many surgeries. I can't even begin to remember how many. <sighs> Upwards of five, maybe even coming up to ten different surgeries to try and remove the endometriosis and it's just not working. It's still there and she's still in so much pain. And, you know, we can tell she's in pain because we know her. But as I said, if if you didn't know her and you walked past her on the street, you'd have no friggin' clue and that amazes me. I wear my emotions on my face. I am very bad at hiding the way I feel about things. Adrienne's amazing at it. And although I'm obligated to say I hate her and she's annoying, and if she ever sees this, I'll say it to her face that she's annoying. Um, but she truly does amaze me every single day that she gets up and keeps going. And I just, I've said it once, I'll say it a million times. I, I love to repeat myself. You can probably tell. She really, truly is amazing. And I hope that if there is somewhere out there that listens to me talk or gets to this part without getting too bored, please look it up. It's a really quick Google search. It'll give you a better explanation than what I did. It's something that needs to be talked about. There's a lot of different diseases that need to be talked about, but again, because this one's close to my heart, I wanna raise awareness for it. And I'm asking you, please just do a really quick Google search. You know, raising awareness can mean a lot to something. The more people are aware of something, the more funding it can get, the more likely there is to find a cure. And there is no cure. And there is no 100% cure to this. You know, the drugs she's on, she can't have children without getting off the pain medication she's on. And we... I don't think that she could be off the pain medication for nine months to have a child. That would be if she successfully got pregnant in the first month of being off the medication, which, you know, isn't a high chance of happening. But um, I think it's going to be very hard for her to do. I think she, she can be determined enough to do it, but whether or not her body will let her push through the pain, I don't know. I don't plan on having children personally, However, if she and her husband asked me to be their surrogate, I'd do it in a heartbeat. I want to be the cool aunt, not the mum. I want to be the aunt because I know how annoying Adrienne can get where the kids call me up and they're like, Auntie Maddie, get me out of here. Mum's being terrible. And I'll be like, I got you. Let's go out. But, um, you know, both her and her husband are moving up in their lives. Um, they've both got stable jobs. They've bought their first home, which is really exciting. That's a really big move. Um, so we're just kind of hoping maybe once they get settled into their home, she can look at trying to wean herself off the medications with helps of doctors and things. She has to go and see several specialists and pain management specialists uh, to try and get this figured out so that she can survive and she can get through the pain to have the children because she will she'll be a good mum I just want to be the really cool aunt I know that's the position I see myself taking I'll be that cool aunt that's always away on holiday and, and brings back really cool gifts and things and uh when you're having like problems with your parents you're like oh come get me they're, they're being they're being so mean and I'll be like got you you can go you can come over <laughs> that that's that's how I see myself um, so that's the tattoo we're getting on this Sunday. I'm really excited to do that. Um, my one's just going to be the ribbon. Uh, I don't know if mum and Adrienne will get the exact same one, but the one Adrienne's planning on getting kind of has a black line that forms the, it ends up with the ribbon and the line forming the shape of the heart. So the ribbon's on one side of the start of the heart and there's just a black line, uh, Fill, filling in the other side to make it into a heart shape um looks really good I'm really excited to get it this will be my third tattoo and so now I'll kind of segue into my other two tattoos that I've got um when I was not younger but younger around 16 I knew people that got tattoos 
and they would say to me it becomes an addiction I'd be like oh that's ridiculous what do you mean getting tattoos becomes an addiction and now I get it it's not a literal addiction but it's more once you get something that represents something meaning to you, to you meaningful to you and your body you kind of want to get other things that are really meaningful to you that's why I'm getting this endometriosis one. So my first tattoo is my little wrist one here. It's a four-leaf clover. Around the time that I was 13, I just started drawing clothes on my wrist. I think I watched a TV show where the main character's lucky charm was the four-leaf clover. And I kind of went, yeah, I like that. I'll start liking four-leaf clovers. And it kind of just progressed from there that whenever I was having struggles or even times during when I was taking a test I remember one time I was drawing it after I finished the test and the teacher had to come and like take my pen away because I was drawing on my arm um it's just something I started doing and I really liked it so in 2018 when I turned 18 uh, I went and got it and basically it not only represents that I'm very lucky uh, each kind of leaf represents a member of my family so mum dad myself and adrian and then the stem can either represent at the moment it probably represents her husband coming into the family and him being my stepbrother he's a really cool stepbrother uh not step you idiot brother-in-law oh that was horrible brother-in-law <laughs> um so maybe one day when i get married the stem will become my husband joining the family i don't know um the second tattoo I got, I don't think I can show it, can I? You probably can't see it. I can't tell if the camera's focused on it. Uh, but basically what it is, is it's a uh, semicolon. And that to me represents my struggle with mental health. So the story behind the semicolon is along the lines of an author can use a full stop to end a sentence or a semicolon to continue on. And that's kind of the way you have to look at life. There's always a way to continue it. Even when you think your life has come to an end, you, you feel like you need to put a stop to it, you can choose to put a semicolon and keep going. And when I read that, I think I read that back in 2016, 17. Yeah, I think I was still in high school when I decided to get, to get that one as well, that I started getting friends to draw it behind my ear, like my artsy friends, I get them to draw it behind my ear so I could get an idea of what it looked like. Um... Thanks, Frissa. <laughs> but yeah, it really, it really meant something to me. Uh, other tattoos I want to get in the future. Again, I'm a big believer in being able to hide your tattoos. A little bit of makeup or long sleeves and that one's gone. You know, hair pulled down and again, a little bit of makeup, so it's gone. The one I'm going to get on my arm, again, sleeves or makeup, it's gone. So the other ones I'm planning on getting are my two boys, so Oscar and Boo, who are in the compilation videos I've put up. Uh, Boo is the fluffy one and Oscar's the ranger boy. Um, I'm planning on getting their paw prints, maybe, I was originally planning on getting them on my hips, but I'm one, not skinny, Tr two, trying to lose weight, three, probably going to put on weight. Because uh, unfortunately with my medications, a lot of people could look at me and go, she's fat because she's fat. I used to not be this big. My lightest was around 75 kilos, which is good for my height. That's around what you should be. The reason I started getting bigger is my medication. I've got, I don't remember which one's which. One of them makes me gain weight very easily. The other one makes me consistently hungry. Even when I've eaten, I'm consistently hungry. Um, so at the moment, I'm trying to lose weight, just doing little things here and there, cutting back on foods. I'm doing the intermittent fasting. I'm doing the 16-8. And at the, well, at the moment, I'm doing that really well. I'm kind of proud of myself for being able to do that. I'm also doing the 30-day sit-up challenge. I've got four days left. I think I'm up to doing a 100 and... I did 150 last night, so I think tonight's 156 um, sit-ups. So I'm really proud of myself at that. I've never stuck to anything this long. So I'm really proud of that. I think I've lost a little bit of weight. Not a lot, but, you know, any progress is good progress. Um, so because of all those reasons and your hips and your stomach are probably the, the parts of your body that's going to change the most... Uh, in, in regards to stretching and stretch marks and wrinkles and things like that. I've 
probably going to change my mind. I still kind of like the idea, but I understand the risks of getting them on your, on your hips. Uh, so I'm going to put them on my back somewhere, probably um, where kind of close to where the heart is, but on my back, if that makes sense. Um, the other ones I want to get is I want to get a stitch, as in Lilo and Stitch. I love Stitch so much. Um, I decided to start liking him. I kind of always liked him as a kid. I remember the first time I watched Lilo and Stitch 2, Stitch has a glitch. I don't know where I pulled that one out of. Um, I cried my eyes out. If you haven't seen that movie, basically uh, Stitch is, I guess you could say sick. He's glitching out because he needs to go into a, a chamber of some sort that, uh, oh, what's his name? Not Pluto. Jumba, Jumba, that Jumba has to build and Jumba can't build it because he's not in the galactic space thing place, he's down on Earth so he's got to find a way to build it otherwise Stitch is basically going to die. And at the end of the movie, um, Lilo and Stitch have had this massive fight because Stitch glitched into this evil kind of alien thing and ruined her dance costume for this really important dance she had to do and she's absolutely gone off at him and then he's like really upset and he runs away and she kind of realizes that something's not quite right he's been really weird lately um so she runs after him and he ends up on a hill and he's dying and it's the most heartbreaking thing you're ever gonna see she's like crying and I was crying and Jumba's got the um the chamber and they put him in and you think because you're a child because I was a child you think he's dead and then the there's like a bar that shows how close he is to death and it starts filling back up to show that he's uh, alive and it's just it's a really good movie um so yeah that was kind of my first with Stitch and then in 2011 we went to Disneyland and we did a character breakfast thing and Stitch gave me a kiss on the cheek and that was kind of, that was when, that's when I was like, all right, you're my favorite. And ever since then, I've kind of had like a little bit of a stitch obsession. Um, I've got two stitches on the floor near me. Um, I'm planning on going to Disneyland hopefully next year once I get a job and can save up the money. Um, and there's a giant stitch I found in Hawaii. And when I'm talking giant, I'm talking friggin' massive. He will not fit in a suitcase. Uh, but who I'm planning on going with... We said we would take turns kind of carrying him on our lap on the uh, plane ride home. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to get a stitch somewhere. I was planning on hi getting him on my hip, but maybe I can get him on my... I don't even know where. Again, I want it somewhere hidden. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking of getting the outline of him. I've seen this really cool tattoo. It's him in an outline, but the outline's done in different colours. So the outline kind of starts in a blue and then it fades to a purple and so on and so forth. It's a really, really cute tattoo. Um, and I was thinking, I'm kind of not as obsessed with Harry Potter as what I was when I decided I wanted this tattoo, which was about three years ago. But to be semi-original but not really original I'm not getting the Deathly Hallows because that's been done to death um, instead I'm gonna get the lightning bolt and maybe a pair of his glasses I was thinking I'm getting that on the back of my neck um, but as I said I'm not as big of a fan as Harry Potter as once as what I once was I've kind of fallen out in lo of love with reading and that's purely because of my depression when when you have severe depression and anxiety you don't find joy in anything that you used to do. I used to be a really avid reader and writer. Uh, for quite a few years, I was determined to finish Year 12, go to London and go to Oxford University to study writing or to study book editing. That dream kind of blew up around Year 11 and all of my ambitions kind of went with it. You know, um... I said I went out with my little sister Emma the other day and you know I look at her she's going into year 10 and I look at uh, a kids going into year 7 and they have so much ambition I kind of go holy shit I used to be just like you you know I used to be that nerdy girl in class who would have an answer for everything and would ask all the questions I'd be the annoying little shit in the front of the class 
um, and through my mental health and as well as a bit of bullying and teasing, I kind of shut that down. I think I might have talked about this, but yeah, got to a point people noticed that I wasn't who I was anymore, you know. It's kind of just that hard to say for me to say I don't know. I'm not. I'm sorry. Let me try that again. It's hard for me to say I'm no longer who I used to be because I don't really know who I used to be. You know, um, we kind of figured out I've had depression since a very young age. Like I'm talking about seven or eight. We think the symptoms kind of started. I always wonder what kind of life I would have led did I not have these mental health problems? You know, would I have ended up going to university and becoming a book publisher or a book editor? Would I have become a writer? Because around year eight, I was writing a book from memory. It wasn't great. It was very cheesy, you know, what a 13-year-old what a thought romance was, um, that kind of book. But other than that, I was trying really hard on it from memory I don't remember other than it being really corny and cheesy I don't think it was that bad um but you know all of that's gone away if you made me sit in front of a computer and said you know write a story write write 10 pages I'd probably have a mental breakdown because I don't have the capacity to think like that anymore I used to be a really imaginative kid um I used used to be really self-sufficient like uh, I remember when my sister was going through her moody teen years, I was still a kid, so I'd go and play by myself in the backyard or with my dolls or whatever. I used to be able to take care of myself. I can't do that anymore. I can take care of myself to a capacity, but I can't be alone for too long, whereas as a kid, it didn't bother me. I really struggle, like today, I was <laughs> really upset. Mum told me to go into the shops to pick up something and she said she wasn't coming with me just go and do it yourself and I was having a lot of anxiety over it and she's like you really need to just suck it up and go and do it and the whole time it's like a really weird feeling I feel like everyone's judging me and for some reason like there's a massive spotlight on me and everyone's gonna see me and be judging me and I know that's not happening they've got their own shit to deal with logically I know that's the dumbest thing to think like they may look at you and have a fleeting thought or not even that their eyes might just glaze over you they don't care they've got their own shit to deal with but even though I can think of it logically I still really struggle to do it like I keep my head down if I'm not like kind of on my phone pretending to, like I'm that type of person that still goes on my phone and pretends to be talking to someone or messaging someone just to avoid interaction and I like when I'm with other people I don't mind interaction I'm that person that I, I'm, a, I'm a customer I've been a customer service representative I love having a chat you know um when I ask someone how their day is going I genuinely want to know and that might sound really weird um if they say they're having a bad day I feel bad for them let's hope I can do this call this task well for them just to just to help out because you know even small things like that can help um so you know I'm not I'm not an unsociable unsociable don't even know if that's a word um person but I'm also f have high social anxiety so I struggle to go up to like takeaway shops and order by myself unless I know the people there. Um, and again, even when I do that, when I'm waiting for my food, I have to be on my phone and I don't, I've refused to look at people because if I look at people, I'm going to feel like they're judging me. Um, I really try to avoid having to go to the shops by myself. Like tomorrow I've got a point and an appointment about 30 minutes away and I know that the appointment's going to take me a while to get called into because that's just how the system works and I'm taking Jack with me because I, I can't stand being alone I really and I'm choosing him because there's no one else that can come with me and you know I just the idea of having to go tomorrow by myself really freaks me out like right now my heart's kind of doing its thing <laughs> it's it's pumping but really fast um and I know it sounds stupid. I know how ridiculous it sounds. And I just wish it was something I could forget or something that the logical side of me could push out 
the illogical side that's saying everyone's judging you. And, you know, I really, I really, really, really struggle. Like, um, say I'm going out to lunch with someone and I want to order from one place but they want to order from another. I will usually end up ordering from the same place as them just so I don't have to walk to the different counter and order myself. It's it's small things like that that um it's uh it makes and I want to say it makes life harder because like there's a million different things that can make life hard and that's really not a big part of it. But you know, it's one of those things that again, I wonder if I didn't have this social anxiety, would I be more outgoing? I I mean compared to my sister I'm the quiet, shy one of the of the family. Um, she gets along with people a lot better than I what I do because I can be really quiet. I'm fine with having a conversation, but I usually won't start that conversation. Like um, with family and friends, I usually just sit and stand there quietly because I struggle to, I guess, draw that attention to myself. If I say something, that the night all eyes are going to be on me. And, you know, I don't want to have a 21st because the idea of the spotlight being on me kind of freaks me out a little bit. I don't mind. I love the attention of my parents. And especially as a teenager, I would fight with my sister for the attention of my parents and like was a bit of an attention seeker. But now when it comes to anything else, I really just... I, I struggle talking to my family sometimes, like not my mum and dad, but like my extended family. And these are people who have watched me grow up and I, and yet I still struggle to talk to them. So it's not like a stranger thing. It's not, I, I'm always so scared that they're going to see me as being rude. That's one of my biggest fears is that when I behave this way, um, and I'm kind of the quiet one and the, especially if there's things that are happening at our house, after a little bit of social interaction, I get really exhausted that I disappear and I don't want to be seen as rude. But, you know, I just, I need to get away sometimes and take a breather. Um, going out with people other than my mum and dad and probably Jack really exhausts me and it's nothing that they do. Um, and I don't know why it happens. I just, I feel absolutely exhausted after. And it's just a really strange feeling to have. Uh, you know, I love spending time with m my friends that I do have. And my little sister the other day had a really good time. But afterwards, I was just so tired and especially emotionally drained. And I just cannot explain why. We didn't talk about anything that was emotionally draining uh, we were mostly talking about how exciting it was for her to be going into your tent I feel so friggin old I knew her since she was five years old and um, it's just it's it's a really strange thing I think I've repeated myself about a thousand times on different topics now so I'm gonna end this one here and if I don't talk good tomorrow I'll talk within the next few days